Hi, Hello. everyone. Hello. Hello. Um, so welcome to season two, episode eight of Inside the Rookery. Today, I'm joined by fellow rooks, um, Andy Law, editor, producer, cartographer, jack of all trades, master of maps, and um, Graham Davis, another fellow rook, Hi. again, writer, um, narrative designer, uh, editor, industry veteran, and all round <laughs> legend. And of course, our <laughs> special guest, um, Morten Storndal. Morten, welcome until our live stream. We are glad at do our har. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to so, be here. Good, we're really happy to have you here. So today we're going to talk about Guiding the Tide, a discussion on working on others' IPs. So as always, we've got some pre-submitted questions to get us started quite a lot this evening, and I'll be taking more comments and questions in the chat. If you'd like to join our pre-show chat in future, then please do come and join our Discord server, which is a lively, friendly, welcoming community um, that everyone is welcome to join. Link on the screen, and we'll put that in the chat later. And if you'd like to support future episodes of Inside the Rookery have a say on topics and participate in exclusive masterclasses with industry legends, then you should absolutely join our Patreon. So all that said, let's either, it's up to Morton, get to questions or hear from you as a little intro to yourself. You can tell me to go straight to questions if you'd rather. No, no I mean, it's, it would be uh, rude not to in introduce myself, I guess. Uh, I guess not many people know who I am. So um, as the bio said, I've been working since eight, since, since 99 with video games uh, in different um, different roles. I started out as an um, environmental artist, uh, 3D, uh, actually studied virtual reality in the late 90s, which was mm. weird and very unusual. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, one more man yes it was <laughs> sort of that uh and and then uh i worked on two games at a company called amuse and then i moved on to um, avalar studios worked as lead level designer on uh, just cause one and two and mm -hmm. then uh moved over to fat shark uh and fat shark. there fat shark and worked <laughs> on on um a number of different games uh, with among them was uh, Vermintide and Vermintide 2. Thank you very and much. With that, I am a very avid Warhammer fan since the age of before times. Uh, and also <laughs> I'm playing mostly uh, uh, Wolfroop, uh, first, second, third, and now fourth edition, uh, Fancy Battles. Uh, and things still do quite right too you are in very good company here <laughs> yeah. your plans. Phew. <laughs> you're on the right <laughs> show um so we'll jump, jump straight into um a question from seagull first here he gets the first question tonight um what is it actually like working with someone else's ip especially when you have to get the visuals and feel of your work right to fit with the mindset of the ip masters Mm. Uh, well, most of the time, when you, when you work with video games, you work on someone else's IP. Uh, it's very, very rare that you come up with your own IP, uh, even within, I mean, even if you work in a company who came up with IP, there's always someone else that mm. came up with it and is very the true. Uh, sort of um, guru on it that you have to ask and, and and so on so uh, it's something that i uh, i watched an old um gdc talk a long time ago about how to do that and the main takeaway for me was find a guru find someone to ask that knows it by heart it doesn't have to be the actual owner but then have someone that you can ask all the stupid questions because that's that's how you because you need to internalize it uh because otherwise it's not going to be no one's going to be happy uh, because mm -hmm. they're not only the the owners of the ip it's the fans as well they have their own sort of image of what the ip is uh, yeah very true 
So, and the question was, so, yeah. yeah. So Siegel, Siegel says, um, <laughs> like asking Andy Law every time someone does a Wolfram map. Then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> every time someone does anything with Wolfram, I've never known such an encyclopedic grasp of the uh, of the canon. Oh, thanks, Graham. Um, uh, uh, my answer in this one is actually identical um, to that, which is uh, when it comes to working in somebody else's IP, you need to have access to the person that actually makes the decisions regarding that IP. So yes. you need to understand where it's starting from. Fortunately, on Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, um, I was kind of that chap. Um, which was super handy because I was also the person that was organizing, creating everything. So that made it a little bit easier. Um, obviously, Games Workshop were the ones who held the IP. But one of the reasons I got the job was because I knew it so well. So um, when I talked to them, my primary questions were, what version of Warhammer are we bringing to life here? My preference would be all versions as much as possible get reflected in the work. Is that also your preference? And is there anything you'd like me to miss out? We have a lovely conversation about all of that. And then we just get to work. And because we were such fans as well, the work was almost certainly going to appeal to fans. <laughs> yep. That's that's true. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the other other side of the coin is know the IP. If mm -hmm. possible, you know, be a fan. And that's yep. everybody's dream to, to work on something that they're a huge fan of. And not everybody gets to do that. But, uh, yeah, if, if you don't have a good feel for the tone of the IP, the themes and everything else, you really need to get one as soon as you can. Yep. <laughs> Do your reading. And, yep. and here's a follow-up question. Oh, Shadow. <laughs> he's trying to... I've got a cat on my lap and he's trying to kill oh. things. He's oh. in a hunting mood. Oh. You, cho Bless you chose the one that said axe rather than asks. I even posted the oh, right sorry. one. Oh, sorry. I thought I, I did tell you to delete. I did tell you to delete the wrong one. I will I stand by that as my excuse. Uh -oh. uh, well, there we go. Sorry, yeah. just a little bit of marital squabbling there for you all to see. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll get the right one. Um, I'll just so, show you know it's live, folks. Kilishandra <laughs> asks, have you ever created anything to see it denied by the holder of the IP? Uh, yeah, of course. That's part of the part of the game, I guess. I guess. Uh, but there's one thing I, I, I remember really strongly. It was we were going to add a ship, a ship to to the the harbor of Uberstrike, and it, that ship also returned in uh, in the um, Death on Reich level later. But uh, when when we put, uh, sent them the the concepts, uh, I mean it was a proper nice looking ship, but there was things missing and add more skulls <laughs> was the thing because we didn't have any skulls on it, and that is yeah mm -hmm. that is I mean if you don't know no -no. that yeah. you <laughs> gotta have those learn that yeah really quickly. Uh, so that was rejected. We fixed it, and then it was approved. Uh, so, yeah, it, 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 that was, that was a, a good lesson to learn. Mm. That that one's hilarious as well because when uh, we were organizing the art for um, Enemy in Shadows, so the first part of the Enemy Within, um, that was pretty much exactly the note that I sent to our artist that was working on some of the boat pictures. Sent them in, and I said, "Yeah, no." Add more skulls, please. <laughs> um, yep. So I was a happy filter before it ever got to Games Workshop yep. um, on the mm. stuff we were creating. So um, the long and short of it is almost everything that we sent off um, was approved first time. It was There was always like tiny little small notes here yeah, and yeah, there yeah. And, and question mm. suggestions. That's just part and parcel of working in somebody else's IP. Um, mm. But we luckily uh, had no refusals. So it's a tough question for you to sit to answer um indeed we not only had no refusals we got a couple of unexpected yeses when we were discussing i mean it was games workshops uh, idea originally to add gnomes for example oh yeah. yeah indeed that was games workshop yeah. that wasn't um us um and i was speaking to them and about a particular character and how it was previously a gnome but yeah. had been sort of ignored and turned into a halfling in later editions um and they said yeah no if you can do a good write-up of that then yeah let's let's run ahead with that and see if we can make it work so i did and and lo and behold <laughs> gnomes yeah. were suddenly added to the game <laughs> <laughs> and there was great rejoicing in certain yeah. quarters. Well, there certainly there was. was. Great um, 
Um, so the next one is from Valister. I never know how to pronounce that, Valister. You, you need Valistari, to tell me. I can't help Valistari, yeah. Um, what's a narrative director as opposed to a writer, head writer? Uh, I think the main thing is I don't write as much. Well, that's a pretty big difference between yes. a writer. Uh, <laughs> exactly. And it's, it's more of a, a big picture, long like broad strokes this is the direction we're going in and and uh, uh, because since i'm not a, a native english speaker it would be i think a mistake to put me on writing player facing text or uh, scripts for for that matter uh so i think that's what i can do this is sort of my saving grace i can still do the work but but not having to do player facing uh, content. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a it's a it's a higher level uh, more broad strokes directional thing. Is that yeah. yeah. And, and in terms sense. of and it, yeah yeah that absolutely makes sense. In terms of the writing on getting produced, do you find it to be harder in your job or harder as the writer, do you think? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Different. Dif yeah. Different. Different. Yeah. Uh, it's probably. No, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. No, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. I've never, never done the writing, the proper writing. Ah, before, well, there we so go. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't know. Mm. Yeah, but uh, you know, riding herd on a bunch of writers has uh, challenges all of its own. I oh yeah, Freeman, yeah. I know that one. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but what did, did you find it more difficult, Andy, to be producer or to be what you had done previously for Wifrup, which was be a writer? Yes. There are so <laughs> many more. There are so many more balls in the air being juggled. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, if you are just writing, you pretty much have a ball which you can move around any way you want, and that's fine. Um, that doesn't mean that the work isn't hard. It doesn't mean that the work isn't time-consuming, but it does mean that the work is, I would argue, much easier to handle. I would agree with that, yeah. I guess it's more focused like that. Yeah, uh, and absolutely. You, but on the other hand, if you get stuck, you get stuck. You can't <laughs> do something else in the meantime and then go that's back. The truth. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Been there. So then the next one's quite a specific technical question oh, from Long Shadow. Very technical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. None of the rest of us can answer this. There seems to be a lot of support for the new Steam Deck console from multiple big name publishers. So is there any light at the end of the tunnel for Linux users that want to play via Steam Play but can't get past EAC, Easy Anti Cheat? Thanks for explaining that acronym, Long Shadow. You know my weakness. Uh, the short answer is probably not. The that was easy. One is I. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> because I'm not really. Uh, I don't know what what the tech guys are doing. Uh, mm. I, I focus on my piece of of, of yeah. production. I don't need, even know if if we are working on Steam Deck stuff. Mm. Uh, I have pre-ordered one. And it's only cool. right and proper. <laughs> um, so Oxecutor has asked, why can we only play four of the Ubers Reich five? Is that right? At a time? Yeah. yeah. Uh, simple, simple answer, actually. Uh, it's because there should always be a choice for the last person in uh, to, to be able to choose one, hmm. at least of two, uh, and not be forced mm. to play. Uh, hmm. Also, there is a certain dynamic when there is four people in a group that doesn't hear the same way if there is five We have a slight technical issue with Morton's mic, I think. So we'll just try and sort that out. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm I was. Yeah. 
Did you meet me? Like, yeah, it, We've got a slight crackle, but it's not as bad as it was. Can you try talking again, Morton, just so we can? Yes, hear? I can. Yeah, you've gone quite quiet. Okay, it might be some hardware. The ah. fire squeaker is broken. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Is it still right? Yeah, it's yeah, coming across really very hear crackly. You. Yeah. Okay, I might need to find another mic. Okay, well, I'll give you a moment right. to do that. Bring up another question that uh, Graham and I'll I I'll bring up another with. question that Graham and you can answer, Andy. Well, um, more tips for another mic. Um, okay, here you go. Oh, no, we've done that one. Sorry. <laughs> it's like, oh, here's a really good one. Oh, no, wait, we've already answered it. Okay, Creative Fossey has had kind of a follow-up to that one, and that was how limited is it working on licensed material and how creative are you allowed to be? That really is a how long is a piece of string sort of question. It depends from IP to IP. It depends uh, who's actually running the IP for the IP holding company. It depends what kind of mood they're in that day. It's uh, uh, Andy, you probably can answer this better than I can, but yeah. It, it... <clears throat> I was just double checking. That's slightly worse. Yeah, no, that's yes. slightly worse again. <laughs> Side. Um, yeah, I, I agree completely. I've worked on a lot of IPs in my time, and you generally find that if it's just, say, writing or creating maps, they've got a very clear delineation as to what they're looking for to begin with. Mm. Um, however, if we're looking at them dealing directly with someone who's an IP holder and is holding a license and you're creating material for their setting, which is a slightly different situation to being hired to create within a realm, um, I tend to find that uh, they're... I've only worked with two in that particular instance, Warhammer being one of them. And in both cases, they were often as excited as we were to be creating within it. Um, and as long as you set your, say, pitch within the very clear borders that they had established, then mm -hmm. you had a lot of creative freedom. Um, so, for example... Uh, take, say, for example, the 40K setting. The 40K setting is a particularly... Uh, wide setting. There are so many corners that you can create that won't impact the rest of the universe. Um, so as long as you are creating within your own little corner, you're fine. Oh dear, that's Mike's not getting better, is it? Um, where with Warhammer, you are creating within the core setting. So sadly, um, you have to be very careful that you don't contradict any of the greater work, which is why, going back to what we were discussing earlier, having somebody that is aware of the existing IP, um, that understands the setting, is core to making it all work. How's it going at your side, uh, Morton? <laughs> Hang on. I just... Oh. Yeah, not great. <laughs> Not no, high, high winds there. Um, it yeah, does the, actually this... sound like storm Eunice has struck Sweden right about now. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, dig deeper and try to find something. Oh, I'm well, it's, it's okay for now. No, actually, yeah, yeah. it's okay at the moment. Yeah, we have okay. the slightest test and we appear to be okay. Yep. So, yeah, let's... I'll yeah. Be really still. Yeah, touch nothing. Yeah, touch <laughs> nothing. And then let's see. So let's bring up another yeah. question, see how it goes. So, okay. uh, well, I was just going to finish oh, yeah. on that point. The, the sticking point uh, is often the case when you're adding to an IP or changing the way something mm, yeah. works, you know, adding or extending. Um, otherwise, you just have to make sure you match the, uh, the tone and themes and don't contradict anything. Yeah, I mean, uh, to use a single example, just because it seems to be the example of the day, Gnomes. That was an entirely new creation that was based upon a very old creation from the first edition of Warhammer. Um, mm -hmm. So creating something that matched the current setting, which at that point was Warhammer 8, in terms of exactly where it stands, the 8th edition of the Warhammer battle game. So making something that matched that in tone and consistency and drew upon that history, while simultaneously also nodded to the original creations that were made all the way back when I didn't have a beard, um, <clears throat> it was super important, but it was also yeah. the one that has the most eyes upon it, because you mm. are now taking, you could argue, potentially liberties with their existing setting, and you've got to yeah. make sure that it nails it. Now, fortunately for us, the gnomes landed first time, um, but it very easily could have been very different. Definitely. Sure. 
shall we jump back to the um the four oh, yeah. of the ubers right so they've so we kind of got that there was choice so but then you started yes. to talk about the balance of having four in the party and that's where oh, we lost right. you okay sorry uh yes uh, it's there is a totally different dynamic uh, if you have four players in a group uh, mm -hmm. or five players in a group uh, because if you have five it's much easier for them to split up in two uh, mm. and then you have two two things to sort of manage and and, and as as the develop, developer or designer so that creates a totally different dynamic uh, so that's why most games actually go with four nowadays uh, mm. it has been a bit up and, up and down but most games nowadays go go with four four in in a, in a party uh, mm. it works online as well it yeah. does it really does it's a good number yeah. yeah yeah manageable there's not too many people shouting down the mic no exactly it's not like yeah. a raid with yeah. 40 people or yeah it like tends to be yeah. a nice conversation yeah. rather than a mm. yeah 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 and it's easier to manage in single player as well i mean going back to the old gold box days that was always a party of four yep. and uh you know now celast of the game andy and i have worked on is a, a party of four single player it is yep. yeah and um, here mm. is one from a follow-up from <laughs> why isn't there a rat catcher with small but vicious dog character it's an iconic warhammer career perhaps yes. the most well, iconic it's an iconic Wurfrup career. I agree. It's a, not an iconic Warhammer career. There's a distinction okay, to be true, made there. True. There is a distinction to be made. I will give you that. Yeah. Uh, I, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't manage to sell it well enough. I think uh, there was some kind of worry that it's not epic. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Yeah. When we had our five, we, we we really tried. For example, we really tried to find another uh, another lore for Sienna mm. uh, than than fire because fire felt so it felt so done. Everyone yeah. does fire, but then we started looking at the spells and everything, and and it's sort of yeah we have to do it because the, all, all the other ones are we don't have the the. The action and, and, and sort of, yeah. um, as you're moving, we're getting crackles. Mm. Okay, I'll stop moving. <laughs> <laughs> it is like stand really, still. really still. Yeah, uh, so that's why. Uh, um, so we, we found five that worked really well together, uh, mm. and we didn't have support for, for the dogs. So. Yeah. yeah, the sound is cutting out again there, just so you're aware. So something has gone, maybe it's not something as well. No, I think uh, it's the this thing. Ah, that, yeah, that has. Yeah. yeah, it's gone super crackly as you moved it. Yeah, so I'll I'll just yeah. have my hands by my side. Well, here's for hoping. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll pick one, Andy, that you and Graham can answer first, and then we can go back to Morton in a second if I could find one. Um, Essentially, I was going to go to the one which was about why Games Workshop don't really encourage fan um, materials. Here we go. Oh, shadow. My cat's still <laughs> lurking at my feet trying to steal things. Um, so Creative Fossey asks, I've heard that it's a no-no for fans fans of the Wifrip to create and publish material for the game. Why is it so if it's true? It's claimed that it's due to the license of the game, but wouldn't it benefit everyone when fans take the game even further. This might be a bit off topic, but I've been wondering about it for a while. I don't think that's actually true. It's not been our experience, Andy, has it? No, it's not true. Um, it's it's a grey area. That much certainly is true. If you create something that's uh, held by somebody else in terms of ownership, um, they can tell you to take it away. That's very much the situation that is the case. And did Games Workshop do that to the past with some fan material? Yes, mm. they absolutely did. Yeah. Um, and have they done it relatively recently with something like, say, the videos that were on YouTube that um, were then asked to be taken down because they were going down their own TV route? Yes, that has also occurred. But in general, for Warmer Fantasy Roleplay, the, the idea has been fans create stuff and keep the game going. That's a good thing. Yeah. Um, uh, as long as you don't use their art, 
Um, so you're actually using their IP directly. As long as you don't use anything that's specifically owned by them, they're mm. quite happy for it to pop online, to be shared, to be used by people mm -hmm. all over the place because it just promotes the hobby. And that's also, a good thing. Yeah, also, as long as you don't charge money for it because that's a direct mm. challenge. And that's exactly where I was about to go. But it has ah. to be free. Right. <laughs> and you can't be making money off it. And indeed, in the past, there were some people who had various Warhammer Fantasy roleplay things with a fee attached to it. I won't mm. go into the specifics as to exactly who they were. And it caused a lot of heartache over at the Games Workshop studio um, because they wanted it to be out there, but they, they didn't want it to be out there in that form. Um, and there was an awful lot of... Uh, difficult decisions made behind the scenes regarding that um so loosely to answer this one it's fine go wild do your own thing and no one's really going to care the internet's a big wild crazy place um but when it comes to you doing it for money no um that may change in the future if there's ever a community content uh for warhammer fantasy roleplay for example but as it currently stands absolutely not mm -hmm. Yeah, isn't the issue with IP if they decide to start charging money or actual copyright laws? And yeah, yeah. there's also the defense of IP issue. So something about recent takedowns yeah. of fan videos yeah. being about establishing a legal defense of their IP. Yeah, I don't know so much about that in um, WIFRIP terms, but I was looking at a few other cases where if you hadn't contested, and this was trademarks, if you hadn't contested it, then actually it just lapsed. So there is some element of there are certain aspects of your IP that you do always have to challenge because otherwise when someone does come in and start making money out of it, if you've let other stuff go, you won't yeah. be able to win that case. No, no, and, you can and that's kind quite of... An, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say that's kind of a, it's a great area because each of those mm. cases are judged on their individual merits. Right. Yeah, but uh, a company can be deemed to have given consent by silence. Yes, and they don't want it to go to court because if it goes to court and they lose, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, and so for yeah. Instance, it would be harder to defend an intellectual property case where you had elves in your game than if you had creatures with pointy ears who you had happened to call the, let's say. El Fari. Right. That, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I would say that yeah. some some aspects of moving towards like bespoke names for your own fantasy species or or yeah, species might um have something yeah. to do with intellectual yeah. property defense. It does. And to just go back briefly to the last question about uh copyright laws and, and stuff like that. Um one thing I do because I, I I put a lot of Wolfrop stuff on my blog and I, because of the position I'm in, I make clear that, you know, this is to be regarded as a fan work, no challenges intended to copyrights and trademarks held by Games Workshop, Cubicle 7 or anyone else. And just that little sentence up there provides some peace of mind. Uh, I would encourage everyone who does their own co uh, content to state up front that this is a fan work. And also the awareness that it's quite possible Games Workshop could come along and say, stop. Yes. I mean, that is um, a risk that you put yourself for. Having said that, the general feeling is that everybody wants everyone to be playing the games. And that's awesome, at least on the pen and paper mm. side. Yeah. Yeah. And Games Workshop, they're smart enough. They don't want to piss off their fans. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it sounds like the mic sorted, I hope. It, hopefully, yeah. Um, so here is a question from um, Kalishandra, I think. Yep. Um, as you're working on the same IP as other companies, do you ever do cross promotion, reference the work of others, put pictures uh, of other people yeah. in your games? <laughs> and yes, over to you. We, we try that, to do that, but it doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, I, I... It was something that when I was um, running Warhammer for me felt important um, because mm. we were all working in the same playground, but so many of the fans seemed to think that each of the various iterations of Warhammer were different. Mm. Um, they would say, for example, that the war game was different to the role-playing game or that these computer games were very different to the fantasy role-playing game or the war game for various reasons. And to a degree, they were correct, but they were all drawing from the same source. So it felt just right to me that if we could work mm. together as and when that was appropriate we should which is why obviously with the starter set when we were working in uber's reich um i was quite happy to say hey 
hey, Martin, um, can, can we possibly uh, draw upon all the cool things that you've done um, and include some of those um, in what we're doing? And thankfully, hey, we're very, very supportive of that. Um, and <laughs> yeah. we were working together quite a lot um, uh, during the build-up to the starter set. I, I, As I've mentioned before, I had a lovely developer build of the game that I could literally fly through. So I could get an an idea of what their version of Uber's Reich was like. Um, so I could then compare that with what we had and everything that needed to be included inside our version of Uber's Reich um, and take that all on board. And it was, I felt, um, a really important part of the process because we are all working on the same thing. And it was something that I felt that working on somebody else's IP brought a great strength with because you got access to this wider pool of creative awesome um that if you had just been a small team yourself you'd never have had access to um and you, you make friends and you chat to people that you wouldn't have normally had that opportunity to make friends with or chat with so for me it was a great strength of working on games workshops properties um the mm -hmm. fact that there was all these other people like last wednesday's um uh, andy hall when we were discussing mm -hmm. warhammer total war exactly the same thing working together as and when you can yeah, and that's how you create something that's greater than the sum of its parts. Hopefully, yes. So um, uh, just in case people don't know, um, as a way of saying thanks for all the extraordinary support that Fat Shark offered while we were putting together mm. the starter set, um, there, <laughs> uh, I, I added them uh, as uh, the Rat Catchers Guild, appropriately enough for uh, Vermintide, um, and added four of their staff members as the actual um, Rat Catchers Guild. It's their actual names and it's their actual picture um, that's um, in there, surrounded by Skaven as they kick ass and take names. Um, <laughs> and that was enormous fun, um, particularly because it was um, handled as a bit of a surprise, uh, as far as I'm aware, um, in yep. that we were doing all that and then Morton was sending us the images and we were putting them all together in the back Round. So when it all got sent over to them, they're like, what? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> and that for us was super fun as well. Um, yeah. And we added um, a flyer advert into the starter set as well for uh, Vermintide, just as a way of saying, thanks so much, you're the best. Um, mm -hmm. So that every single copy that went out there, there was another, hopefully, Vermintide customer waiting to happen so they could wander around Uber's Reich for real, so to speak. Yeah. So, and... Yeah, well, uh, how how was it? What was it like it was, being immortalized? It, it, it was unreal, <laughs> uh, but totally humbling, and, and we're very very happy uh, about it because uh, we've hired a lot of people lately, uh, and a lot of them that sort of started reading all the material we have in the office, and then it's like, oh wait, you guys are in this. So it's, it's like it happens over and over and over again. Which is... Very cool. That's the best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so pleased that I got to do it because it was, um, I remember when we were discussing the art with Sam who did the uh, painting, um, it, he was so delighted to be doing it as well because um, we had received so much uh, concept art and uh, screenshots and similar um, from Fat Shark. And he'd used a lot of those for the basis for other pieces of art he'd been doing. So when he got an opportunity to then paint them, he was like, yes, this is great. <laughs> yeah. And he was super pleased that it was a surprise as well, because that, you know, it just felt like you were giving a proper gift. Um, yeah. yeah, it was good. Mm -hmm. And so, Plus, so, I also yeah, I, um, put the Fat Shark symbol into the um, uh, book as well. It's hiding yeah. behind the... Uh, the sign that's on the uh, page. I painted that one myself. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so how many of Fat Shark staff play with Rip? It's, looks like it's clearly a big influence on the game. Stromdorf in particular is very much as described in The Gathering Storm. Um, I think we are maybe three groups on and off. Uh, number of people. I I played it with my. That's not a patcher. It's a patcher. They have some. Um, you're fading out completely there. I'm sorry to say, Martin. Oh, again. Yeah, you you were just fading out. I could barely hear you. Mm. That's that's a little better. Yeah. Yeah, I need to get a better mic. 
Yeah, that's better. <laughs> that's what yep. we've learned from the stream. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, no, just, we are a bunch of people, basically. Uh, not like here regularly all the time, but I mean, we have this stuff at the old history. Hmm. I can't hear you again. Yeah, I'll bring up this. Oh, Shadow. Oh my God. This is like the cha most chaotic stream ever. The cat. Um, <laughs> so, Long Shadow says, I think we called a pub the fat shark in our game based on that sign. And well, I, but I think that's lovely. And um, those Easter eggs, re collaborators, is great and stuff. Um, Seagoat says, The Gathering Storm is a great module. And yep. um, Janov36 says, Andy, every week I drool over your tunnel fighter pick. Original? Mm -hmm. Sorry, off yes. topic. <laughs> yep. Yes, it's the original from the uh, original. Wolf yeah, of the original. One, Tony Ackland. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, mm. Yes, um, it's one of Tony's pieces. Um, I've got a few of them. I'm surprised the you can I... actually see what that is. From Clearly, Andy's much smaller on my screen. I think you have to know what it is to see what it is, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I've got the original Fimmer as well. I've got the original uh, Scholar, as I recall, which was Rick Priestley. Was it Scholar? Scribe was Rick Scribe, Priestley. Scribe, yeah. that was it. Yeah, of course it was Scribe. Um, yeah, good times. Yeah, Shadow oh. the Cat is looking for it. It's not actually, it's looking for snacks, which I foolishly located near my laptop today. Mm -hmm. So He does love chicken. What is next? Let's go back up to the questions that were pre-submitted um i'll just see now shadow's gone when he would actually be like helpful to help me <laughs> pass the time when i'm scrolling up these ridiculous amount of questions and comments um long shadow asking for a friend he sure is uh will there be gnomes in vermintide perhaps a de <laughs> depiction of glim <laughs> Yeah, you, you should know, Morton, if you don't know already, that the uh, since the publication of Gnomes as a Playable Race in Rough Nights and Hard Days, the uh, the long-suppressed gnome community in Woofrup fandom has gone crazy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I don't think so. Uh... <laughs> hmm. They are no, invasive and elusive people. They are. Yes. Yes. They, they, they might but be I there. Think... You just won't see them. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're already there. Yeah. Have you found them? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you um, tend to find for so, a game like, say, Vermintide, you're looking to present core concepts of the setting because there's yeah. only a few pillars that they've got yeah. um, to show what Warhammer is. And yeah. gnomes are about as far away from a core concept of Warhammer as you can possibly get. Um, mm -hmm. That's why archetypical characters like, you know, Slayers and uh, right. our Bright Wizards and whatever yeah. Are, yeah. are the ones yeah. that are coming to the fore. Yeah. Exactly, Hell. Witch Hunters. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Ones that feel epic on Warhammer and pretty much go, oh, ah, uh, Warhammer! Yeah. Um, <laughs> where with the role play game where you can go into all the tiny little niches and little crypts That's in the, the corners, um, yeah. you've got more opportunity to investigate perhaps the odder things that might express themselves in the Warhammer world. Um, mm. uh, but having said that, I mean, we had a lovely conversation about wine bottles in the Warhammer world, uh, Morton and oh, I, at yeah, one point. Um, yeah, they're in there now. Yeah, marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot. Um, I, yeah, I remember that conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and uh, what, exactly how wine bottles would express, what they would look like, uh, what different labels you would get, because uh, they were going to be putting some of them into, I presume, a level somewhere. I forget now. Um, yep. And uh, a great conversation came from that. And I sent over a whole ton of examples of um, things that could pop up. Excellent. Um, so here, here's another one from Kilishandra. What IP would you like to work on that you never have? Uh, me, that would probably be Call of Cthulhu. Did you say Call of Cthulhu? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Call. Yeah, good one. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, it is a problematic IP, but I think, yeah, that would be amazing. I'm quite interested to see what um, Green Ronin have recently been doing. They're doing Cthulhu Awakens, a new Kickstarter, actually, um, and they've gone they've gone for 
Um, this is Cthulhu and all of its problematic beginnings. We're going to walk away from that and create what we think it would be in a modern um, environment. Yep. It's a very, a very interesting retelling of it all. Um, worth having a look yep. at if no one has. And yeah, Cthulhu's great. I've worked on Cthulhu quite a lot. Um, uh, done a, a lot of work on uh, different campaigns at various points. Do love Cthulhu. Um, Graham, have for you me, worked on Cthulhu? Sorry, Andy. Oh, okay. um, a little bit, yeah. Uh, so actually, the uh, the first thing I published with Games Workshop before I was even working for them was a, a couple of sections in their uh, UK source book, Green and Pleasant Land, and uh, did a few adventures for uh, for White Dwarf. Um, and no really huge products, though. Uh, did a little bit of writing in dark show, dark corners of the earth. Nice. Um, and for one that I haven't worked on, um, I'm currently playing Horizon Forbidden West. And oh, my God, I love that game. It's really good. And it, all it does is make me want to write something for it every time I sit down with it, because it's just such a, a, a fresh and interesting take that I really enjoy. Um, and if we're sticking on the video game side, the other one that I always look at that I wish I'd done something with or could have done something with was Mass Effect, because I just mm. love Mass Effect. Mm -hmm. As anyone who has um, listened to me over the last few years knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tough one for me. I mean, uh, goodness, I guess the first IP that was really formative in my life was Thunderbirds, but I'm not sure. I've, uh, I've worked on Thunderbirds. You have? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, d I did a big map yeah. for the Thunderbirds board game. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> there you yeah, go. I did a, <laughs> when I was at Games Workshop, I tried to shop around a, a sort of Century 21 uh, game that would include Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet and all the rest. But, dun, dun, uh, dun, 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 dun. Exactly. Uh, that came to nothing. Um, <laughs> As these things often do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, other than that, I tend to, if I see an IP I like, I'm just completely shameless. I'll ping someone and say, hey, I like this. I've done this, this, and this. Uh, can I write for you? And oftentimes they'll say yes. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> so Creative Fossey has asked, what do you find the most interesting working on these kind of games? Is it the settings, the development of the games, or is it the joy of being part of something that can be enjoyed by others? I think it's different in, in the different sort of stages of development. Uh, at the beginning, it's mostly the setting and the sort of dive, really deep diving into mm. sort of what are we doing and what's it going to be. Because early on, there are no limits and everything is okay and everything is possible. Yeah. And, and uh, then it starts to narrow down into actually out there <clears throat> mm. and then it i guess it's the part of the production development side of it uh, and then when you finally release it you go that's the thing that keeps you going yeah that that's the one that keeps you coming back the next time where do you hit uh yeah I think that, that, yeah. that's it for me. Um, yeah. Seagull says, Graham pinging someone and me pinging someone is the difference between night and day. <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> so, Graham, you were one of the creators of Bogenhafen or Bergenhafen. I have seen a video where you were shown around the Vermintide version. How did it compare to your imagining? Uh, it was an absolutely amazing experience. I'm, I'm not a very visual thinker. Uh, so to actually see the thing realized uh, and, and there rather than sort of theoretical and in my head was just uh, incredible. It was a hundred times better than anything I could have imagined. That's just lovely, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I remember when it was getting put together because um, I got a ping about it as well. And we were discussing population sizes, the position mm. of a temple and various other things. And um I am quite the opposite. I'm a very visual thinker. Um, almost all of my creations have generally come hand in hand with me imagining what they look like um, and getting a very clear idea of where things are and how big they are, how small they are or something similar. Um, because I like to ensure that if I know what I'm talking about, I can then be sure it's got a consistent vein all the way through it. That's so true. regardless of what you turn it into when it's given to somebody else, I know mm. that my thinking behind the thing all makes sense. Mm. Um 
But yeah, it was super pleasing because I remember the blog getting created by Graham, as I recall, when um, uh, they were moving over into Bergenhafen. Um, and he did a blog for Fat Shark about uh, moving into yeah. the new um, area. And I remember speaking to Graham about, it must have been about a week after it went, and he was giddy. I was. It's true. <laughs> he was <laughs> giddy. He yeah. was like, this was great. <laughs> and did you see this bit? And did you see that bit? And yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's just lovely. Yeah. And as a follow up to that, Oxacuter asks, could we have an explorer mode so I can walk my Wifford players through Uber's Reich, showing them all the places they've been to in our tabletop game? Um, in theory, yes. Uh, I guess one problem is that the map isn't complete in the level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's just it's just a stage, so only the important parts for that particular mission is visible. Mm. It's not a coherent map. It's like this mm -hmm. street is sure. that level, and yeah. this other street. And the, so that would be amazing to, to put together a proper free roaming map mm -hmm. uh, and uh, strike. And I'm sure it could be done, but it's yeah. Mm. Time and resources. Yeah. It is. Time and resources. Yeah. 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 I mean, it would be astonishing. Um, uh, I, I mentioned I flew through various parts, but I'd fl fly through different levels to get access yep. to different areas. Yeah. Yep, um, yep. And as I lifted up, um, there was Magnus's tower over there, and there was big, vast waves of nothing in between because mm. they weren't needed um, as assets no. for that particular no. level. Yeah. If we we're making our way down one particular street to arrive at an apothecary and then head off towards a wizard's tower or something similar, everything that was needed for that and the very close environment around that, completely there, and that was super useful. Um, fly back, and you might see the bridge, or you might see some other bits because they might be seen in the background as parts of the background elements. But if it wasn't seen, why put it in there? It would just make everything yep. run slower. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But but it, I imagine in, as a concept, it could be easily done because what was there was marvelous. Mm. Yeah, Infinite yeah. Saxon says just before we come to the Cazalid question, something I've always thought was great about Vermintide Two is the a quiet drink level and the way its map stitches together elements of existing maps. And um, Seagull seconds up to turn and says that they would pay for a walkthrough map of Uber's right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, so would I. I mean, just mm, oh, yeah. just just to see it because I, I love yeah. the place and have done so yeah. much work in it over the years. Yeah. Um, and Long Shadow yeah. asks Graham if there's a link to the video that the person yeah. saw about you being shown round. Can we provide uh, that? Not necessarily now, but possibly afterwards. I can. Yes, I can definitely shoot that across to you. I'm, I'm going to go to this one. Uh, what motivated the Grail Knight career for Kruber, considering the existence of the original and somewhat similar Foot Knight career? Because they're awesome. Because they're awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. And, and I, Legitimate answer. Yeah. It, it was. It was a, a quite a, some some different reasoning behind it. We wanted him to. Uh, it was the first career we made. So it needed to be pretty straightforward, uh, not complicated and uh, development heavy and new features and uh, things like mm -hmm. that. So we needed to keep it simple. Uh, also, I was deep into Petonia at that point. I was painting my night and I was like, oh, this is great, this is going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the thing. Uh, it was, it felt appropriate because then he would become a noble and he would be able to talk down to Victor. That was an important thing. Nice. Uh, yeah, so I think those were the main reasons. Mm. Because we, we had some character development there. Yeah. And um, Oxecutor asks, can Franz Lohner and Morgan Bernhardt, I love Morgan Bernhardt, ever be seen in the same room together? I don't think so. <laughs> that is a shame. <laughs> because what does it mean? Mm. Um, so will Vermintide 2 be supported past the release of Dark Tide? Yes, absolutely. We have no plans for Sunset 
Nice. Oh. Excellent. Yeah. It's too, too good of a game. Yeah, absolutely. As long as people play. Hmm. Yeah. And as long as you can watch Skaven Ragdoll all day, why wouldn't you play it? <laughs> hey. <laughs> oh, yes. so many entertaining ways <laughs> yes yeah, so infinite saxon says the character relationship changes i hadn't considered great answer thanks i think that is a really i i hadn't considered that either but that change in dynamic and then what that means you can do with dialogue and the way they interact with each yeah. other yeah, makes yeah, it yeah, a yeah. bit more interesting yeah, yeah. Since, since the dialogue is so important for us yes we, we want to mm. leverage that that we're really make difference and when they evolve and when they yeah which brings us conveniently back to the earlier question how many castle words have you invented thanks graham because i've lost that question so yeah, yeah. how many castle words did you need to invent i don't know sorry <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think we mostly combine words mm. uh, to, to get you know, meaning, new meanings, but with, uh, with the roots in, in the old one. Mm. Did you yeah. just, did you, a Scandinavian, just say that you created some compound words that's <laughs> unprecedented? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of what we do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. yeah, you know, given the fact that dwarves often tend to end up depicted as short Vikings, and uh, yeah. I will admit I did use a, a tiny Danish to English dictionary when I was creating oh, castle words way back in the 80s. I, I mutilated and stretched them beyond all recognition, but that was my starting point. There's, there, there are some that can be written. So, uh, yeah. I didn't know that, Graham, that that mm. was part of your um, background for dwarves. Yeah, I always I, kind of, sorry, on you go. I, I you know, I started with uh, just sort of words and phrases for the elves, and it seemed logical to sort of mash up. Um, I have a, a Scots Gaelic dictionary and another Welsh dictionary. And that sort of Celtic background tended to give us the the right feel for Elvis, you know, with lots of L's and uh, the, the right sort of letter distribution and cadence to them. Um, and so when I had to create uh, words in Cazalid, I thought, well, we want something kind of that sounds to English speaking ears. And I apologize in advance, Morton, but it sounds like stones banging together and uh, guttural and that sort of thing. <laughs> Yeah. I, th I think you're talking about Danish people now, Graham. I probably, well, I was using a Danish dictionary, so there you yeah, go. Oh, yeah. there, well, you go. there you go. I, I, I've heard from many sources that Danish is not a terribly civilised sort of language. Oh, harsh. <laughs> it's just, it's just I'm the just pronunciation. quoting what I was told. The pronunciation <laughs> is somewhat down in the throat, I think. Um, uh, yeah, so so dwarves. That's interesting. Um, a little tangent on language. So I've always thought they were quite a literal people. But if you drew on kind of Danish and Old Norse roots, did you think about kennings for them? Like they they don't call humans humans. They call and they don't call human buildings human buildings. They call them I don't know Umgi. shoddy something. What are yeah. they, Andy? You'll know that. Umgi. Umgi is the word for humans. Me shoddy. Yeah. 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 So um, was that what you were thinking of um, calling on Graham? It was in the back of my mind to do something with with Kennings, but I never actually got to it. Uh, the actual amount of Kazalid that I was called upon to write while I was at Games Workshop was fairly modest. And then uh, Alfred Nunez came along with Stone and Steel and just uh, did a whole lot more. It's worth saying, though, that the most of what was in Stone of Steel was already in the army list, the first army list that was created out of the studio, mm -hmm. um, where you got the core lexicon that was used. And I think we've all adapted at one point or another for a particular word to mean oh, one yeah. thing or another. It had it had all the counting in there. It had quite a lot of word endings in there. It had quite mm -hmm. a lot of core word meanings in there as well, which just got uplifted and repeated again and again and again in the later yeah. editions. Um, and true. my my Gazalid creations are similarly drawn from that source. And mm. when there isn't a word, which is actually relatively rare because they covered quite a lot, um, it's very easy to just create something that's in a very similar vein. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. 
very easy mm -hmm. um like for example when we we're naming all the rune fangs um and ensuring that they that, that was a surprisingly easy process or mm -hmm. naming uh weapons that were created by dwarves back in the day but may have had a human name attached to it translating it back to the original yeah, name well, again not too difficult the rune fang the rune fang names are classic old norse kennings like that's exactly how you would describe swords in old sagas. You wouldn't say it's a sword. You'd say mm. it was a goblin biter or it was, I don't know, like a yeah. head slicer. And you would use different ones every time. Mountain so cleaver. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, totally. And uh mm. uh keeping that, I mean, look, Galmaraz itself, good old mm. skull splitter. Um yeah. It's the same sort of idea um, and duplicating that through not a very hard job, but a surprisingly fun one and a surprisingly painstaking one for me, at least, because you want it to be right. Mm. So you, it takes altogether too much research for often what is just one tiny little word in oh, yeah. overall enormous amount of text. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, and so, the answer to that one is is no, and we really should have. And the answer from my side was yes, I oh, had one. Because <laughs> you're you. Because, because you're I, you. Yeah. I built what my about, own for, one. Yeah, what about Fat Shark? Do you have a dictionary of Kazalid words and Elven words? Or? I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm that kind of person. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. you need one, right? Um, I, I did yeah, something for Drew here for the Dark Elves as well, something similar to to mm. build up um, the Dark Elf language and also for uh, the Elfarine of um, the High Elves because whenever you need to create a word or whenever you need to look at somebody else's word that they've created, you've got to ensure it's consistent. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it and also, the only way to do that is to have a core that you're building yeah. from. Yeah, we're I'm also we're to talking. Sorry, Graham, you Sorry, go I, and then I, I'll. I started to do that a little bit when I was working on uh, Eldar words and phrases because uh, I was working with Jez. I got to write up the, the Harlequins and some of the subsequent Eldar troop types for the first time when he introduced them and then also in uh, Adeptus Titanicus. So mm -hmm. I, but I didn't get very far with it. I probably about 20 or 30 sort of root words in the end. We've only Not got three minutes left. Built. We've only oh, got three yeah. minutes left, so so I will be wrapping up. But that actually touches on the topic of next week, which, I, as I said, I think our patrons um, voted on the topic and we're going to be talking about um, not all humans. So we're actually going to be talking about different species um, in role playing games, how you can make them just not just, I don't know, a short, stout human, a human with pointy ears. And one of the <laughs> things that really we'll probably talk about next week is language. For example, I have always loved the idea that a dark elf um, mother or father having their son or daughter come back from a fight says, I don't want to kill you, which is basically them saying, I'm really, really proud of you. <laughs> yeah. But they're dark elves, so they simply right. express yeah. it as a negative murder. Yeah. So hopefully we'll be talking about that next week, along there with you know. the other aspect that make non-human species um, different to just plain human. So um, thank you so much for joining us, um, Morton, this evening. I'm sorry about the mic issues. We didn't yeah. hear from you maybe quite as much as we, we could have done. So we'll just have to have you back to have another chat um, some other time. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> please. And, and I'll, I'll make sure to have a bathroom microphone. Yeah. <laughs> And you will always be very welcome. Um, yeah, so please do uh, like, share, subscribe on YouTube. As I said at the start, check out Discord, check out our Patreon. And um, we will see you all next week for another edition of Inside the Rookery. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs> okay, not as smooth as usual. <laughs> like, where's my video? <laughs>